So welcome to the final awards plenary uh, presentation of this meeting. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the recipient of the 2019 G. Evelyn Hutchinson Award, Dr. Oscar Schofield, who's distinguished professor in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University. So the Hutchinson Award is one, of the, is one of ASLO's most prestigious awards, and it's given annually to a scientist who's made exceptional contributions to limnology and oceanography in the early and middle stages of their career, and who shows promise of continued scientific excellence into the future. Oscar is receiving this award for transforming our understanding of the physical and chemical processes that govern marine phytoplankton physiology and ecology through the application of novel ocean observing tools, and for his skillful and enthusiastic leadership of the collaborative science necessary for addressing broad scale oceanographic challenges. So Oscar is a biological oceanographer who's made important contributions to the understanding of diverse ocean ecosystems from the North Atlantic to Antarctica. And beginning with his doctoral research at University of, Cal of California, Santa Barbara, where he investigated impacts of the Antarctic ozone hole on phytoplankton, a central motivation of his work has been developing new approaches that can collect data on ecologically relevant spatial and temporal scales. His pioneering use of remote ocean observing tools to measure phytoplankton dynamics at higher frequency and resolution and at larger scales than traditional ship-based sampling is a hallmark of his career. Through continual innovation of a range of technologies and by coupling with remote sensing, Oscar and his collaborators have developed a more comprehensive approach to understand how marine ecosystems function and are influenced by climate. Those technologies, these technologies have resulted in the deployment of ocean observing networks throughout the world, which has been spearheaded by the Rutgers Center for Ocean Observing Leadership, which Oscar co-founded and helps to lead. The nature of Oscar's research is by necessity highly collaborative and demands effective leadership, team building, and mentorship. His commitment to these roles is greatly valued by his colleagues and students, and his easygoing nature is a great motivator for those around him. In addition to his excellent teaching and mentoring, he's highly committed to public outreach. And finally, it must be recognized that Oscar's innovation is matched by his prolific publication record which includes over 180 publications that have garnered upwards of 10,000 citations. So in summary, Oscar is a highly deserving recipient of the Hutchinson Award, who has helped transform the field of oceanography through his impressive body of work and his enrichment of many people's experience in science, and who will continue to thrive and contribute long into the future. So please join me in congratulating Oscar Schofield. be wearing this for the rest of the afternoon. So. First off, I want to thank ASLO. It was the first meeting I went to as an undergraduate, um, and it's been sort of the place I go to get recharged from all the meetings I go to. So thank you, ASLO, for organizing this for all of us. Um, and it's humbling to be associated with Hutchinson, and it's even more humbling to be associated with a long list of names who've been given the award before because they're my heroes. Um, my take home message is really for the young scientists and the next generation is follow Hutchinson's model of curiosity and be ready to do career changes. You know, I was trained as a cell biologist, oceanographer, now people think I'm an engineer, which is a total joke. Um, <laughs> And I sort of always default to Doug Webb's quote that he's given us to work by, which is work hard, have fun, and change the world. And that generation that's coming is going to change the world and meet the needs. I wanted to give a two, uh, shout out to my two major advisors at Santa Barbara. 
Barbara Preslin, who got me interested in physiological ecology and how that drives the biogeochemistry and diversity in the ocean. At the same time, I had a co-advisor, Ray Smith, and he was pretty adamant. We all acknowledge we have a sampling problem in the ocean. Let's solve it, you know, rather than just acknowledge that it's there. And we need to solve it because the oceans are changing. And there were the early records of that sort of happening when I was in graduate school. And on top of it, in the lecture we saw yesterday, is we need to translate science knowledge into things that help society immediately. We can't have a big lag phase, you know, not only for the problems they'll solve, but also to keep them involved with us to see we're doing important things. And at the time in the 90s and the early 2000s, there was sort of a recognition, you know, and so I pulled out the heaviest hitter I could find, Walter Monk, and he pretty much acknowledged that the physical oceanographers and chemical oceanographers, despite lots of hard work, did not provide synoptic views of the ocean sufficient to help a biologist. You know, they, and the problem we were having in oceanography is there was a lot of big open questions and we didn't have enough data where we could falsify any of them. You know, so we could all remain in our little parallel ivory towers. Um, and that was good through tenure. But then after that, it was time to get on and try to move on. And so in the 90s, there was this work of developing ocean observatories, ocean networks, and there were all these things. And what you've seen globally over the last two decades is the largest investment in ocean infrastructure um, this century. Um, and it's based on all kinds of technology. So how do you build an observatory? First thing you do is you draw a cartoon. You know, and so that's your vision of the future. So I was hired by Fred Grassley, and that was his cartoon that we all were going to march to. Took about five years, and then um, with NSF support, the LEO 15 Observatory, Ecosystem Observatory, was established, and it was a seafloor cable. There's a picture of it on the docks. It actually sunk the docks down into the mud. We had to repair it afterwards. Um, it was 11 tons, and it went 10 kilometers offshore. And I just want to give you an example of how even a single point in the ocean can be so illuminating. So when we were installing it, there was this experiment looking at benthic stresses, and they were putting out bass tripods. The sensor that they're putting is here. This is prior to the deployment. Scientist is unwashed, hasn't shaved, getting everything ready. Instrument's beautiful and clean. You leave it in the ocean for a month, it looks like this. It's grown a beard. The scientist, actually wearing the same clothes, has shaved and is clean, um, which is great. And so they get their data after a year, and they compare their theory to the observations. And the only time theory worked was during extreme storms. Didn't work at moderate winds, didn't work at normal low conditions. And they would send divers down there. They wouldn't see anything wrong. They'd bring the instruments back to the lab. They'd look at it. Looks good. Calibrations look good. So we installed a video camera on LEO 15, looking at the sensors. And it really drives home the importance of being present. That's the turbulence sensor right in there. <laughs> and so the physical oceanographers realized they needed biologists, because they were really looking at turbulence around a fish body. And while it's dorky, this is what we're experiencing all the time in oceanography. And so, when we built our observatory, we wanted to look at biogeochemistry along New Jersey. And so we have these pockets circled here in red. The colors is the seafloor. And these were regions of recurrent low oxygen in the bottom waters, enough where you could kill shellfish. And so it's New Jersey. So obviously the answer is, is there's lots of pollution pouring off the state, driving these recurrent hypoxia zones. And the entire management scheme of the state was based on that hypothesis. Um, and we built our first network right here in this zone. So we wanted to study that. And it was a time there was a big technology revolution starting, and so my colleagues, Scott Glenn and Josh Kohut, we started exploring of how you try to network all the technologies at once. And so with partnership with uh, NSF, uh, NRL, and uh, lots of people, NASA, we established this high-resolution sampling grid. And we wanted to sample this upwelling event that was going to be all this pollution pouring off. First thing we noticed is right in our zone where the low oxygen was, was a recurrent upwelling eddy. It formed six times every summer. It lived for about five days. Um, 
and it was associated with a lot of uh, organic matter. So, okay, we change our idea. It's a typical upwelling scenario. We get upwelling in specific zones. This location was fixed year after year because it was driven by the seafloor irregular, irregular bathymetry. Um, and was it a typical upwelling scenario? No. So we're doing two transects, one through the eddy, one to the north of it. Um, and here you're looking at ADCP data. Um, this was the first time the ADCP had been carried by a robot. So that was our big victory. But what we discovered is this little jet. And in this jet was all this organic matter being collected and scavenged from the shelf and being dumped into the eddy and pumping it full of material. Things weren't really growing when you measured them directly. Essentially, these dynamics were essentially collecting organic matter for an entire coastal zone and dumping it into these fixed locations. And this eddy, this jet, was about 10 meters deep and three kilometers wide. And until we actually got in and measured that whole area synoptically, we had no clue it even existed. And so um, the message here was you had to touch and be persistent in these regions to figure out the process underlying the biogeochemical changes. Um, and this is, if you actually get in a plane and you fly over these eddies, this is what it looks like. You know, and so this idea that New Jersey, you know, was pumping a lot of stuff that was driving blooms wasn't true at all. It was scavenged by physical oceanography and dumped in his own. And it was enough to explain the low DO. It's changed the whole management strategy because we invited the state to be part of our experiment. And so now the state of New Jersey actually monitors all its coastal water quality um, with gliders. You know, and you can essentially, instead of getting 100 data points, which they used to get, you give them about half a million data points over the summer. I encourage you all to involve these communities in your experiments. They'll be very active, and they'll be so grateful to do it. As a total pragmatic reason, they like this project so much, they write the grant for us, they send it to us, we sign it and send it back. Um, so as a young scientist, there's a lot of benefit. But for, for us, the nice thing was, was here was a discovery of these dynamic features that were immediately translated into science policy within a year or two. And we're into 10 years of robotic sampling. What ultimately drives all the process I just talked about is this undersea river off New Jersey, the Mid-Atlantic Coal Pool. It's 1,000 kilometers long. It's dynamic, it varies in space, and what we've discovered over the years is it's actually central if you want to describe phytoplankton productivity, biogeochemistry, fisheries, hurricane intensity, ocean atmosphere dynamics. And so how do you map a 1,000 kilometer feature that drives most of the things you're interested in when you can't see it from space and you have no way of monitoring it? And that's where these integrated networks is. So I love gliders but you need to use all the tools you have. We'll never replace ships at sea. So at, you know, at that time, you mature technologies in your local regions, and it's been done all around the country. You know, if you look at the NOAA IUS program, there's 13 RAs, and then there's NSF-sponsored ones. And so the great victory is, is these networks exist. They're being hardened. And now we're going to transport them to areas seeing really large change. And so I joined uh, Hugh Ducklow's long-term ecological research project down at Palmer. Um, and we're essentially working in this location in Antarctica. We just finished, I think it was our 27th year down there in the field season. And the re when the program was written, the idea was with sea ice dro drove all the ecology. And so let's do it here because there's Palmer Station, a lot of assets. Um, we didn't know at the time that it was being placed in the area that was going to show the largest sea ice loss uh, in the Southern Ocean over the last 20 years. And so it was completely fortuitous that we ended up in this location. Um, but it's allowed us to study how large changes ripple through food webs. So here's a picture of a graph. You're looking at year, winter air temperature, and it's the fastest winter warming location on the planet. So it's almost raised seven degrees in the winter. And you're talking about a sea ice system that drives the ecology where crossing the melting point is a singular change in the entire system. 
And if you see this, how there's a lot of variance in the early years, and this transition to low variance is actually, as a system is transitioned into being a maritime dominated system. Um, and so you would expect a lot of it. Here's sea ice. You can see there's a general decline. There's a lot of big oscillations. These oscillations are driven by the El Nino, La Nina cycles and their interactions with the southern annular mode over the continent. So you have these cyclical climate processes interacting that drive these features. Um, the two lines, one's in the north, one's in the south, just shows it's coherent over the whole thing. Um, so you have, actually what ends up being really cool is you have a series of resiliency experiments. If we turned ice back on, will the ecosystem recover? So you can use the natural variability to ask cool questions. And the other thing that drove the formation of the project um, was the penguins had this irregular rookery locations along the peninsula. You know, there's lots of areas that you don't really find penguins breeding. And this was discovered by Bill Frazier. Um, and so the question was, was why? And is it gonna change? Did it have to do with sea ice? Um, and so it's been studied for years with visual counts. It's transitioned to radio tagged animals. Um, so we can actually see where they're foraging. And the motivation was, well, it's changing. And it's changing quickly. So the Adelie penguin is one of the two polar penguin species. There's happy feet, the emperor, and then the, the Adelies. The Adelies are about up to my knee. Um, and at Palmer Station, when Bill started in the 70s, there were 15,000 breeding pairs on those local islands. There's about 1,000 left. And, you know, the, we have sort of a standing bet of when the Adelie will disappear. Doesn't mean the system is shutting down completely. It's changing. So we have two new evasive penguin species, subpolar species, that are moving in and filling the niche. You know, and so we're in this transition, we want to know the driver. Well, is it food? Well, what we do know about this system, it's a tightly coupled food web. So you're looking here at chlorophyll anomalies in black, bacterial anomalies in stippled bars. And so if you're above zero, it's a big chlorophyll year. If you're below zero, it's a low chlorophyll year. This entire time, Bill has been doing penguin diet samples. We do not kill the penguins. That's not what's causing the decline, I want to point out. You uh, pour some seawater down their throat, and they throw up, and then you sort the throw up. And so he's been doing it for decades. And what you want to look at here is these years when you have a positive anomaly, the population is dominated by big krill, adult krill. You have a big party in the ocean. What happens? Lots of food. Mood music goes on and you have a great recruitment event, and you reset the entire population size down to larval species. So you can see this recurrent pattern of big chlorophyll years translating into big recruitment events. So it's very tightly coupled. Um, and so, okay, phytoplankton, the base of the food web, are potentially a big driver. What's happened over the last 30 years of this? Well. This is where um, we've been looking at sort of all the ocean color satellites, all the lineage and tweaking algorithms and all that stuff, and taking the difference. So this is really um, comparing the 70s and 80s to the late 1990s. And so if it's red, it means that chlorophyll has increased. Blue is where chlorophyll has decreased. So let's look at the south first. Why is this increased? Well, this used to be covered by sea ice used to have a tabletop over the ocean. It was very dark. You didn't have much phytoplankton growth. If you look to the north, there have been substantial decreases. And the driver there, we hypothesize and are still working on, is this has become ice-free. It's exposed to the wind in the winter. It's a very windy place. On top of it, the trends show wind has been increasing. And on top of it, the atmosphere has become moister. And so the cloud cover has increased dramatically. And this is a dark ocean already, and now you're mixing, and you've decreased the amount of light hitting the surface ocean. Um, so that doesn't bode well for those animals really tightly coupled. So what's the driver? You know, what's melting what? You know, we know the atmosphere is cold, and the only heat source that can explain the rise in temperatures in the atmosphere is the circumpolar ocean. It's down at about 300 meters, so you really can't see it. Um, 
it's very, very warm. It's like three to four degrees. Balmy, just like Puerto Rico here. Um, and it's very large, whoops. It's very large and it um, impinges right on the West Antarctic Peninsula. And so the idea is, is this large ocean current, one of the largest on the planet, is essentially interacting with the continental shelf, delivering heat. Because we know it's the only thing warm enough to warm the atmosphere to the degree we've seen it. Um, the two places that are melting in Antarctica right now is this location and this location down around the Totten Ice Shelf. You know, and so where the circumpolar current is close to the continent, we see a change. And so what's melting Antarctica? It's the deep ocean. It's one we can't sample. There's been a large program called SOCOM trying to get the temperature right on it. So here's one of the largest currents on the Earth melting in Antarctica, and we're still trying to get the bottom temperatures right. What does that bode for when we do simulations going forward with climate? Um, but we're gonna solve that. The problem is, is when that current interacts with the shelf edge, it forms, so the current's running along here, it forms eddies, and they're tiny. They're about 15 to 30 kilometers wide. They have a lifetime of 7.7 .7 days, according to moorings, and they squirt two to three times a week onto the shelf. And over time, they dissipate, and that's what's warming the system and diffusing heat out to the atmosphere. So as an observationalist, I love going to see how do you sample a 30 kilometer eddy that's irregular in space and time when you can't see it from space and you have no predictive um, capacity to say when they're forming. And yet it's the fundamental thing warming the whole system. Um, from mooring work, we realized that they were glacially carved canyons um, and that there seemed to be some association with these eddies with these canyons coming in at two or 300 meters deep. You can't sample that from a ship, so we went to the robots, the gliders. Gliders are great. Um, because they can be out there for sustained periods of time and you can constantly adjust what it's supposed to do. And so we set up picket lines and when we encountered the water mass, which we could fingerprint based on temperature, if it's two degrees or warmer, it had to come from the circumpolar current. That's one thing beautiful about this system. So you go back and forth, back and forth, you encounter the water and then you essentially try to surf the eddy for as long as possible underwater at 300 meters. Eventually, you'd fall out of the eddy, you can jump ahead, catch it again. And so essentially here, we're surfing an undersea small scale feature for about seven days. That was science fiction when I was a graduate. Well, actually the robots were, the gliders were science fiction at that point. Henry Stommel first introduced the concept in 1989 in the first issue of the Oceanography Society of his vision of the future. And you can see here, this uh, gets bluer, greener, it's diffusing heat as it's being transported along these glacial canyons. Um, and it's becoming more amorphous. Um, so we can actually sample these small scale features. And so we've been mapping them over time and so these are all different eddies, the size and the color indicate the heat. Um, and then we track it, you know, as much as we can. And if you sort of look at what these eddies look like when they're going from offshore to inshore, they're losing heat, um, they're losing height, their radius is getting smaller. So now we can actually track where these undersea eddies are. That's really cool. But if you look at where they terminate in these canyons, that's where those penguin colonies are. And so the thinking is, is when this was a completely ice covered system, and you wanted to predict sort of a region where a penguin would be happy in wintertime, it's where there would be a pollinia forming. So it had access to water and the ocean in the wintertime. And the pollinias would be formed by these little eddies delivering heat consistently guided by these glacially carved canyons from a long time ago. If that happens, we should see upwelled heat at the penguin colonies. So Bill Frazier, he's one of the last great naturalists. If you ever have a chance to have a beer with him, take it. His stories are amazing. Um, and he had wanted to test this upwelling picture 
and he never had an opportunity. Well, with a glider, we do. And uh, there's your upwelling heat right beside um, the colony. Here's another colony further to the south, um, and it's on the side of the island where a lot of heat's being injected. You find the colony, not on the other side of the island. Even all the way down to the south, you can see this little blip of heat. And that heat originated from the offshore deep ocean. And so if you want to understand penguin ecology, you have to know your physical oceanography. And uh, that's a great opportunity. So there's other penguins moving in. Why are they doing well and the delis are doing bad? Well, we've been combining the robotic ones, the gliders, propeller-driven ones, thanks to my colleagues, um, along with radio-tagged animals and trying to relate where they're foraging. The Adelis do really well in the early summer. That's when the mixed layer depths are very shallow. But as winds pick up in the late summer, um, only the Gentoos are diving deep. And these di di deep dives by the Gentoos correspond to where you find peak krill aggregations and chlorophyll maxima. And so essentially the subpolar species has a more malleable behavior. And it adjusts to the conditions while the Adelis growing up in the Antarctic for generation after generation, are super conservative. They don't really deviate from what's been hardwired into their system. Um, and that seems to be a general strategy you see for a lot of Antarctic life. All right, so those are two examples where small jets, small eddies actually drive the ecology. And you couldn't have actually sampled those things without some of these new advances in technology. But it's also leading to another generation yeah, we can cross, whoops, we can do scaling experiments that we always dreamed we were going to do. Um, but we can change oceanography. We can change the definition of an oceanographer. If you go to a classroom and you at, hand them all, all the kids a piece of paper, give them a pencil, and say, draw an oceanographer or draw a scientist, it's usually a bald man wearing glasses, wearing a lab coat. And our point is, is that actually all the kids in the room are oceanographers. We can't wait for them to go through a PhD degree. We need them to be scientists from day one and get them in train, because doing science is the funnest part. And the revolution is with um, Iridium. Data is now freely available to anyone who has access to the web. It took a cultural change. In the beginning, I was warned not to give my data away for free. It would hurt my career. Turned out okay. Um, but it allows anybody to be an ocean explorer in real time and get to be in the excitement of science before we know the answer. Usually we teach it from textbooks where the, you, know, you sit at the fireplace and you're drinking your scotch and the little benzene ring pops up and you go, oh, epiphany. A lot of it's failure and a lot of it's an adventure trying to make things work. And we can open that up to the community. When we formed the cool room, this is the cool room here, um, we didn't really sort of keep track of stuff. We just sort of putting stuff out on the web. We got sued, and it led to NOAA's open sky policy being clarified. But then we started looking at web hits. Right now, we get about 6,000 unique visitors coming to the website a month. And in summer, it's a quarter of a million web hits a day. 70% of those web hits are the general public, if you look at the domain name. And they hit the website at the same times every day. Right after lunch, they've come back to their New York building, they're in their cubicle, they want to go fishing, they go in, they log into satellites and current maps, then there's a lag in the afternoon, and then at 5.30, they log back on when they've opened their beer and essentially are deciding whether, to, whether and where to play hooky the next day. People are hungry for data, we just need to give it to them. And then uh, we were at a meeting in uh, Europe and Rick Spinrad uh, essentially invited us out, and the conversation started with a sentence, you have to do something for the good of your country. You're like, oh my god. Um, and his main point is this National Academy had study was saying that had made um, countries in the developed world very strong was that they were used to taking risks in their science back then. And as money's constrained, too often we become risk adverse. And as we become risk averse, we're not very good at selling ourselves with grand visions, and we're going to lose a generation of STEM scientists. So um, he pretty much told us, get a glider, modify it, fly it across the Atlantic, and have your students do the flying. And at the time, 
Um, this was the red line, what he wanted. The green line is as far as we had gone on a single mission. So we redesigned the whole thing with Teledyne and did it. First one got all the way to the Azores, was eaten by a shark. <laughs> Students were devastated, um, but it drove home the concept that you gotta take risks to do good science. Um, second one made it all the way to Spain. Um, and our class, which started with two students, grew into anywhere from 50 to 70 students every term. And the real thing that we think was important was about 30% were non-science majors. They were religious studies, they were language. You know, they were gonna be lawyers, which meant that they were actually gonna be important as opposed to scientists. But now we essentially let them essentially be ocean literate and carry the message for us. And here we are in Spain with Rick, our dean, and these school kids had started interacting with New Jersey school kids, and the New Jersey school kids had put 100 letters personalized to the Spanish school kids. So it was the slowest mail delivery ever. <laughs> so we started looking at the impact on the education. It led to a big increase in enrollment of marine science majors. It increased our diversity, almost doubled it, and that hasn't changed. Um, and on top of it, sort of informal research theses versus formal research theses jumped. And we were just doing our normal thing. We can do this and not compromise our science and at the same time and train the next generation. So in conclusion, sampling limitations cripple our interpretation of what we see. And while we have a long way to go, and that's why I look forward to seeing what all the new generation is going to do, um, we, I think, are getting to the point where we can actually start mapping Hutchinson biotypes, which he would call in space and time. And uh, the new technologies are going to change how the next generation does scientists, uh, does experiments. They might actually be at sea 365 days a year while teaching their classes and their students being part of it because we have global omnipresence now. Um, and these new approaches can also change how we engage society. And we heard a wonderful talk yesterday about the importance of it and changing perception of scientists, well, show them the data is useful to their life today, tomorrow. Um, and then sort of following the lectures that have happened this entire week and the inspirational stories from Puerto Rico recovering from Hurricane Maria, let's follow their lead. Let's not sort of sit in our ivory towers. Let's pull together. Let's be resilient to meet the hard problems. Let's put the easy ones away. Let's actually tackle the hard problems. Risk is good and we're gonna meet those challenges together. So I'm gonna stop there. Again, two of my heroes, Doug Webb, inventor of much of the Argo float technology that's in the ocean and the gliders, that's his mantra. And this is from the oceanography article in 1989 of Henry Stommel, thinking about what would it be like to be an oceanographer if we had omnipresence. So I'll stop there and I'm very honored and I thank the society for everything they do.